Sam, I know you love the NBA. I know you love hoops. Do you love talking about the Lakers as much as you probably have to talk about them these days? <laughs> uh, yeah, no complaints on the, the Laker talk. I mean, listen, if you're in the media, as you can relate to, you know, the bigger the fan base, the more folks are, are enjoying the commentary and the coverage. So, uh, yeah, no problems there. Got, got to play the hits sometimes. Well, let me ask you then about the Lakers and the concern – here with the injury situation. Obviously, Anthony Davis has been out for a while. Uh, LeBron's going to be out probably for around a month or so. Do you anticipate them making a move, maybe trying to add a little shooting here before the trade deadline on Thursday? I mean, I'm sure they're going to be active. They're pretty limited, though, in what they're able to do. Um, they're pretty close to their hard cap. They they don't have the kinds of pieces that I think that they're willing to move out in terms of their bigger picture that's in play, the, the, you know, the title defense and, and the idea that once LeBron and AD get back, you know, you can't be losing a, uh, a Dennis Schroeder or Montrose Harrell, anybody like that who might not be able to, to help carry you now, but is going to come in handy and you hope you know, be part of that championship picture once you're whole again. So, you know, you hear consistently them tied to, uh, rim protection is it is JaVale McGee going to come back somebody like that um, you know now of course they they could use you know players with uh, kind of a more versatile skill set because of the injury stuff but I'd be surprised if they really found any real legitimate answers on that front in the next two days maybe somebody on the buyout market like an Andre Drummond could end up you know eh? oh sure yeah yeah Andre's one that, that you know he's gonna certainly be uh, sought after quite a bit if that buyout ends up happening and it probably will i mean i think he's around 30 million with his his Cavs deal so the, the big would be my focus with them uh and then just kind of trying to tread water you know i have this theory everybody's worried that they have to you know they fall down to a seven or an eight seed and they have to do the whole play-in deal to get into the tournament i almost think that if i'm lebron that makes the story even better if they were able to win again <laughs> right Sure. If they, I mean, if they're able to win again, a hundred percent, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, yeah, it'd be a great storyline, um, but and, and far be it from me to ever question the guy who keeps showing us that that's a bad idea, but 36 year old LeBron coming off a, a, a serious ankle injury, you know, having to then take out a, an elite Western conference team in the first round, you know, and, and fight your way kind of up the championship mountain from there. Uh, to me, the West is is loaded enough, and there's enough parity that, you know, if you were asking me to bet, uh, you know, on the Lakers or the field, in, in that scenario, I'd probably be betting on the field. It would be hard, but but certainly right. it would make the story better. So trade deadline coming up Thursday. Um, Aaron Gordon being shopped. Um, Kyle Lowry uh, could be on the move from Toronto. Uh, Marvin Bagley, as you alluded to in one of your articles, uh, the Kings have not found any any takers for him yet. Um, what what are a couple of moves or trades that you expect to happen here before the trade deadline? Well, the the Gordon situation has been a focal point of mine. We we wrote about the situation with Boston the other day, and and the kind of revelation that Aaron asked for a trade last month. Um, you know, formally, and, and I think that will happen. Uh, I think right now I would still handicap Boston as the, the leader, but Denver is definitely in the mix and definitely wants Aaron. And it's kind of that, you know, now it's that game, the cat and mouse game of uh, there's still time on the clock. And like the Nuggets, for instance, don't want to be too desperate. They don't feel like they have to make a move. The Celtics have a ton of pressure on them, you know, playing 500 basketball when you have two all-stars who are used to being in the conference finals is, is not a good equation. Um, and so I'm curious to see where that goes. I think if Aaron moves, it's going to be one of those two teams, you know, Lowry, it, it, I, I thought Kyle was going to stay put because his money is so hard to match $30 million on an expiring deal. But you know, there is a lot of noise about Philly and, and Miami and, and, and the Clippers have been interested, but, but I don't, they, you know, they can't get their money wise. So, you know, Kyle's another one, and, and staying in Toronto, or, or Tampa to be more specific, uh, Norman Powell's another guy with a ton of teams chasing him and, and I think is going to be a nice addition to uh, to probably a contender. So I think we're going to have a bunch of, like, you know, kind of second- and third-tier guys probably get moved. As you know, Dan, it's, it's not a superstar trade deadline season. You know, after the Harden 
trade went down, there's really nobody else out there of that caliber, but I think it'll be active. Speaking of superstars, um, Brooklyn, the team to beat. I mean, is it, once they're healthy and once they have all the parts there, do you see anybody being able to take them down? I don't know. I mean, I kind of love how wide open it is because, yeah, there's moments when you say, yeah, how do you beat that trio? Well, for one, that trio has barely been together. Now you got Kyrie missing games for family reasons, you know, and having another absence. Um, the Durant injury obviously is, is a problem you feel for Kevin, man. He spent so much time on the sideline the last couple of years, and now to have to go through it again, you know, and, and even James has been banged up. So, you know, I'm not sold on them as the title front runner. Here's the funny part to me is like we're guilty in the media – of being very narrative driven. And so Milwaukee jumps out because it's like, I feel like in the media, we've unofficially decided that, that Giannis can't be the back to back to back MVP just because they fell short in the playoffs. But he, uh, you know, had been playing well before he got a little bit banged up as well. But, you know, the bucks are a team that I think we're sleeping on again. And, and Giannis in particular and his MVP candidacy, but, I mean, there's, you know, the Utah Clippers, Lakers, all the way down the line, Philly. um, I really, I probably have recency bias a little bit, but I feel like, you know, more than in past years, it's just really wide open. But Brooklyn's the most compelling team from the standpoint of we love super teams and, and monitoring whether or not they can maximize their incredible talent. And so I'm hoping in that vein that the Nets are healthy when the playoff time comes around because I really want to see if they can have chemistry and if they can go out and be the team that, that we think they might be able to be. Yeah, so do I. I mean, it's, it's an incredible collection of talent they have there in Brooklyn. Speaking of maximizing potential, I feel like Lonzo Ball is, is closer to maximizing potential, and, and he's in line to get a much bigger payday than we anticipated that he would be getting uh, a couple of years ago. I saw yesterday or the day before where Michael Thompson, Clay Thompson's dad, who – uh, calls Lakers games on the radio, said, I'd love to see Lonzo end up in Golden State. Is that something you could see coming to fruition? I could, yeah. Uh, it is. There's like a leveling out of the Lonzo market happening where, you know, phase one was the incredibly overhyped opening with LeVar, you know, telling the world that Lonzo was going to be the next coming of, of you know, Steve Nash combined with, with, uh, you know, Gary Payton and Chris Paul and all the best point guards of all time, um, Magic Johnson, chief among them, and, and, and that was just too much, and so Lonzo couldn't live up to that. But now that he's getting closer to free agency and, you know, that he has developed, and really his defensive side of the ball and his ability to, to play both guard positions has made him a, a nice fit and for a lot of teams, and that has a lot to do with, all the interest because if it's Atlanta, right. And they look at it and they go, ah, you know what? I think Lonzo can maybe play with Trey. If it's the Warriors, you know, and you have a, a healthy Clay Thompson with Steph and Lonzo as a three guard set. I mean, that would be pretty dangerous. And, and so to Lonzo's credit, he's checking a lot more boxes as a player than I think, you know, coming out of, of uh, you know, in the beginning, it was all about his playmaking and that was it. Um, he and his camp want, and kind of expect to, to be getting around $20 million a year uh, in free agency. That's kind of the, the word among teams that are interested. And so, you know, that's kind of the unofficial price tag you have to consider. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, I don't know. The Warriors have that, that, you know, that draft pick that is the most valuable asset in the league right now. And so, you know, I, I doubt they'd be willing to give up something like that for Lonzo. But um, if they were able to get him, I think he – he certainly would uh, would take them to a new level. Yeah, he's averaging career highs in, in, in points and three-point field goal percentage, become a much better shooter uh, since he entered the league. Speaking of the draft, obviously you've been watching the NCAA tournament like the rest of us. Who's who's popped? Who, who have you noticed that it's going to be a, a, a difference maker? <laughs> then i got to be honest with you, brother. I'm just going to own it. I have not been diving in. I've been in trade mode. Um, I don't know what it is. You know, I mean, we, we had a good time on – my podcast yesterday to, uh, joking about Cade Cunningham, one of my co-hosts, Anthony Slater is an Oklahoma state alum. And, and he was dishing a little bit of uh, Cade Cunningham slander and saying that he thought he might be a little overhyped. So that's kind of been the extent of my NCAA focus. I just know that, I mean, if through the NBA lens, 
Um, you know, the idea that you could have, you know, in the neighborhood of, of five franchise changing type players is, you know, it's coloring decisions that are happening right now. And that, that part has always been really interesting to me because, you know, you got teams in real time deciding, are we going to tank? Are we going to go for it and try to sneak into the playoffs? What are we going to do? And that calculus is tied, you know, to not only the draft, but then now in real time with the tournament, you know, like you said, who's popping and who's not. So, you know, that's going to have a ripple effect, uh, you know, but admittedly I probably should uh, start diving a little bit more and, and watching the action right now. Well, probably not a fair question for you with the trade deadline coming up. So believe me, I completely <laughs> a little understand busy. A little busy. <laughs> during, during football season. It's, it's certainly all about football for me, and I'm not watching as much college as I do uh, NFL, no doubt about that. Uh, the Kate Cunningham stuff is interesting because I think he's a nice player, but man, Mobley has really been impressive from what I've seen uh, in the tournament. And the other thing that's really fascinating to me, Dan Helley sitting up for Rich Eisen, uh, talking to Sam Amick, senior NBA writer from the Atlantic, is what's happening with the G League and the, the players now who are choosing to go to the G League instead of overseas or instead of college for a year and this new program that they have where they can pay them half a million dollars and they can sign shoe deals. And they're going to be developed and play against solid competition. How has that been uh, looked at this year? Has it been already designated as a success? I think the answer is yes. But then the, the kind of asterisk is that the pandemic made things, I mean, it made things hard on everybody, but it, it, it really impacted the G League quite a bit. Now, they did pull off the G League bubble and kind of made the best of a challenging situation, but by and large, uh, 100% the reputation of the G League and previously known as the D League has changed in the kind of way that it it's a whole lot closer to being a, a baseball-style minor league system now uh, than ever because it, it, it's funny. I mean, I've covered the league roughly for, I guess, 17 years now. And, you know, in the beginning, um, when a player got assigned to the D League, I mean, it, it was like getting a sign from a pro team back to a college team. I mean, you were, you know, guys would probably, you know, more likely to just quit and try some other avenue than they were to take that assignment and feel okay about it. It was not the JV team. It, it was something even worse than that. So now you have guys that if they're not getting enough burn with their NBA team, I mean, you even hear stories about guys saying, could you put me on assignment down with the G League team? Let me actually go improve and, and you know there's not that that uh that complex about that path so yeah it, it's a legitimate thing and they you know they were smart enough to know that money makes the world go round and, and you've got to incentivize these guys to to get paid real basketball money as opposed to the you know i mean in the beginning it was like twenty five thousand dollar annual stipends right. to uh to go play in, in the d league and it's it's on a whole different level now well and they have that ignite team now and you look at some of these mock drafts and uh, you, you have Jalen Green, who's going to be a top four, top five pick. Jonathan Kaminga, I, I believe I'm saying that correctly. And both those guys uh, in in the G League, you know, as, as teenagers. So um, certainly that. Yeah, uh, and you got the coaching aspect too, you know, with, with Brian Shaw and people like that being part of it, adds credibility, you know, former head coaches. So, uh, yeah, it's it's really, I mean, listen, all around the league, um, they, they're, they're kind of a more comprehensive, robust system now than they were even 10, 15 years ago. Yeah, certainly coming a long way. Sam Amick, senior NBA writer from The Athletic. Sam, thank you so much for joining us. Appreciate the time, my man. You got it, Dan. Thanks, man. Hey, you watched all the way to the end. Thanks for that. Watch more right here.